You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. And belly on up to the nine foot homemade oak bar. Pour yourself a cold one. 30 minutes of socks for fans, by fans, awaits you. Ed at the other end of the bar. My name is Chris. We are Socks in the Basement. And Scott Grigger from the Daily Herald will be joining us later on here in this program. And it's all brought to you by Family Waterproofing Solutions. Family owned, veteran owned, female owned. They have ways to. Diagnose the problem either on site or online. Whatever you are comfortable with, take care of the issues. Trust me, you may have a problem when the world thaws out. It's always an issue. Make sure you get a checkup with Family Waterproofing Solutions. The estimates are free. Tell them that we sent you. You get money off. The phone number and the website right on the logo for Socks in the Basement on your podcast player, famws.com. Ed, how you doing? I'm doing great, Chris. How are you doing? I'm hanging in, man. I uh, First of all, sad stuff uh, that Hank Aaron died. I mean, w- uh, I was just watching something the other night about uh, Tommy Lasorda and Don Sutton on MLB Network. And then right. and then I see that uh, Hank Aaron passes away. And this is like one of those, we're on, a, we're on a bad string right now with really good baseball players dying. That's one of those highlights like you weren't alive for. Like, I wasn't alive for when he hit that home run, I don't think. When did he hit the home run? When did he, when did he break the record? It was in the 70s, we, we, right? No, we... Yeah, we were not alive. Neither of us were alive during during that time frame. But but you knew about it. Like that that was that was the home run king when we were kids. I've seen the replay of it a billion times in my life. Even yeah. before cable television, the replay of that with the two guys that run out and run alongside of him, and you later find out it just scared the heck out of him. And otherwise, uh, I'm kind of gearing up for what the White Sox are going to do next. I find it kind of funny this week that I'm seeing a lot of people in kind of insinuate. And it's, you know, these things catch fire uh, on social media, like that they're out of money or they only have like a couple million dollars left. I don't think that's the case. It's something we're going to ask Scott Gregor about. I really do think this team is still going to go get a a pitcher and a hitter. And I am leaning right now personally, if I had to pick one like move or let's say it would be two moves, but this is how I would spend whatever's left. I would go get the bargain basement fourth starter. I, I really think if, if you are in some sort of monetary trouble or you set some arbitrary spending limit on uh, on the general manager and Rick Hahn now knows he only has so much, if you get, if you can go beg for one more big contract and then just do a small contract, I would go get a guy like a Chris Archer to fill that role at the bottom of the rotation and I would talk to my pitching coach like amongst this handful of guys that we think can do something, we can get a good price on one of them. And then I would throw all my chips in on getting Ozuna. You know, once the MLB decides there's a universal DH, which is completely possible still for this season, everybody's in on him. Right now, the market is thinner. Like, maybe this is the guy you pounce on and put in your order. What do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I've seen the same thing where everyone's saying they're out of money. I, I've, I've seen people saying that, you know, swearing up and down that nothing's going to happen because the Sox fully believe in Andrew Vaughn this year as the DH. Uh, I've also seen some crazy looking, you know, insinuations. I kind of wrote about them on the blog, but, uh, you know, trades that really are not going to happen and signing guys that I'm not sure that, that the Sox really need to sign unless it is that bargain basement type of a situation that you're describing. Uh, but if you are going to make one more big move, Marcelo Zuna is the guy out there that is the best bat available. So yeah, why wouldn't you throw in all your chips on him? Springer's gone. Brantley's gone off the market. You've got other teams that could still be in on Ozuna, but what the Braves, for example, are waiting for before they bring him back is to find out, are they going to have that DH option or are they going to have to commit to him every day in left field? And if they wanted to commit to him every day in left field, he'd be in Atlanta right now. They don't want to do that. So, yeah, jump on him now if you're going to jump on anybody. If you can go to Jerry and say, hey, look, I, I want I want one more contract, let's do that. The other guy that you could do that with, if you really think that you're just giving Vaughn one year to shake it all out and, and get ready to go and be ready to, to play every day, would be to give Nelson Cruz one more shot at 40 home runs and stick it to the Twins for not signing him. Yeah, that'd be awesome, you know? wouldn't it? 
I mean, it, 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 I would feel like there was the possibility he would have that drop off like Encarnacion did. Like, remember, sometimes you sign that really old slugger and you're like, maybe he's got one more year in him and he doesn't like he would make he would make me nervous. We get Encarnacion part two, because at some point everybody gets old, but I wouldn't be upset if you did it, because even if you have faith in Andrew Vaughn, somebody else has to start in that position and Vaughn isn't going to be up for, I don't think, the first couple of months. Big news coming out if you're an Andrew Vaughn fan. And trust me, I think the guy is going to be great. I just don't think that you want to have him penciled in as that's the reason why you're not adding a bat this season. Andrew Vaughn comes out as number one on the MLB pipeline top 10 first baseman for 2021. Top 10 first base prospects for 2021. And what's amazing about it when you read the article, how they kind of list all 10 of these, these prospects. Vaughn is hands down, hands down the best. Like in, in a way in which number two, which is Tristan. And I want to say, I, I think his last name is Cassis Cassis. I'm Cassis, not sure. Cassis, Cass, whatever. Yeah. I don't know him very well houses. because I have a better Tristan first houses. baseman than the Red Sox have in my, in my pipeline. So I, why do I care? <laughs> yeah, okay? exactly. So, but Andrew Vaughn is heads and tails in front of him. They go through each tool. The best hit tool, the only guy with a scouting grade of 65, which I believe 80 is like you're perfect. If you have a prospect that's at 65 or 60, he's really, really good. He's going to hit a lot. He's going to hit a ton. He's got a 65. He's the only first base prospect with a 65 hit tool. In power, there's five guys with 60, but Vaughn's one of them, right? So he's got the hitting thing. He's right up at the top of the list. Later on down there, they point out he has the highest ceiling where he could be a very special middle of the order bat with uh, an over 300 average and 30 plus homers and a ton of walks every single year. He also has the highest floor, according to all their scouts, because even if it doesn't all click, he's a capable run producer who's going to continue to play in the big leagues. Like you have a you have a major league player, even if he doesn't do well, he can't fail. This is like one of these guys, but the thing is, you don't know whether or not he's going to get out of the gate right away. Think about the Aloy Jimenez first year. Gangbusters, big slump, had to adjust year two, he was better. Think about the Luis Robert last year. He jumps out and then terrible month in there. I mean, he's a rookie of the year candidate, they're saying on here, Andrew Vaughn. And these are all great platitudes. I feel good about him. I'm still, I still want that other bat though, man. I want Vaughn to hit his way onto the team. I don't want it handed to him because he's a rookie and it's not necessarily about some, you know, I don't, I don't have some like weird thing where I don't like rookies on my team or something like that. I mean, a rookie can be a savior in their own words, but what I I'm looking for with Vaughn is I, I want somebody to push him, somebody to really, really push him. I don't want necessarily him to be pushed by Adam Engel. I want him to be pushed by someone where he has got to hit his way past a veteran who, by all means, should have that spot walking out of camp. If Vaughn goes through, if we have you know a, a normal spring training and Vaughn just tears the cover off the ball and whoever the Sox signed to be the DH ahead of him scuffles or doesn't look like they have it or you know they they took a flyer on a guy who's not Marcelo Zuna who is not an established guy and they and they want someone in that who might be a bit of a reclamation project or might end up just being bench depth for them if Vaughn hits his way past him day 1 I want him there he can you know put him in the 7th spot where I think everybody's sort of assuming that you know your your DH is going to be in this lineup let him ride but just saying you're going to walk in, you're going to give this guy in spring training. Okay, here, look, you're on the opening day roster, barring some injury or something like that. Uh, you know, that's going to put some pressure on Vaughn too. And what you don't want this guy to do is you don't want him to take this advanced approach that they're talking about this, you know, great eye, this great hit tool and get pull happy because he's trying to hit everything out of the park or push because that's what happens. I think with these rookies, that's what happened with Aloy. He came out, there was adjustments made to him. He was pressing a little bit to try and keep up. It took him a while to figure out what was going on. Robert last year came out, everybody adjusted to him. He was pressing because they're in the middle of a pennant race. It took him a while to figure it out. Vaughn's going to go through the same thing. Madrigal's going to go through the same thing this year too. It's just going to happen. Tim Anderson is on the cover 
of RBI Baseball 21. We have a cover. We have a cover guy. Of a video game. This is yes. how big the White Sox are right now. This is how big Tim Anderson is. Scott Gregor from the Daily Herald sat down with him after he made the cover. He's had multiple conversations with him. So we're going to get in with Scott into the mindset of a TA and where he goes next in 2021. That's next year on Socks in the Basement. Found everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SocksInTheBasement.com. You know, I get muscle aches all the time. I've gone from being able to do whatever I want to and not feeling any pain to basically getting pain for any kind of physical activity. Good news, there's a local family-owned Southside business that provides a CBD topical that will not break the bank. Creaky Bone Balm offers concentrated relief for creaky bones. It is an effective hemp-based CBD in a rejuvenating balm. And guess what? It's made in small batches, always free of preservatives, and all natural ingredients. It's great for muscle aches, tension, inflammation, joint pain. You can even use it for skin ailments like burns and dry cracked skin. Right now, go to creakybone.com and use the promo code BASEMENT. Get 20% off your order. Whether it's physical activity or off-season stress, Creaky Bone's gonna help you out. Use that promo code BASEMENT, 20% off your order, right now at creakybone.com. Joining me on the phone line right now, first time we've had him on the show, great to have him from the Daily Herald, the guy who covers the White Sox for them, and has been around for a while, Scott Greger on Sox in the Basement. How are you, Scott? I'm doing great, Chris. How are you? I'm doing great, too. I, I appreciate you jumping on. There's so much to get into, but I want to start right off with the story that you had just recently on Tim Anderson the reaction to the fact that he was on the RBI uh, baseball 2021 video game cover. And I I'm starting to feel like Jose Abreu may be what people think is like the, the father figure on the bench, but the face of the team has to be Anderson now. Right. Is it, is that, is that crazy for me to say that? I mean, he's, he's the face of the white Sox publicly. I agree with you a hundred percent. Tim, you know, it's like just going back to when he came up, the White Sox had a horrible year they had in 2016. Uh, Robin Ventura's last year as manager, and they were desperate. And I think they kind of rushed him up from AAA just to try to get something going. He came up about uh, just about midway through the season. And, you know, everybody knew he was a first-round draft pick. But I think everybody also remembered that he was, you know, better known as a basketball player when he was in college, high school. And, you know, Tim struggled. I mean, it was a lot of pressure on him. Uh People thought, you know, he, he's never going to be able to play shortstop. He's going to strike out too much. He won't, he'll never really be a impact kind of a hitter. You know, here we are now, like four, you know, four some years later, and he's got a, he won a batting title two years ago, finished second last season, uh, really improved as a shortstop, g- great athlete. But even, you know, more than that, Chris, is that he, is, he just embraces, you know, it's, it's kind of hard when you know, there's so much pressure just, you know, just to play the game. You know, much less talk about it, talk to the reporters and talk to everybody, you know, but uh, he's so really good with that. He's got a lot to say. He's really an interesting guy. He's, you know, he's had in his background. You know, I think everybody knows his background. His, his best friend was murdered. Just a lot of things. He's had a lot of challenges to get to where he's at. But, um, you know, you, it's kind of a cliche about, you know, you just never stop working. And he's like the embodiment of that. And it's really all coming together for him now. And. Not only, you know, I don't think, you know, even last year, really, or 2019, not too many people knew who Tim Anderson was, you know, outside of the south side of Chicago. And now, I mean, he's just, he's a, he's really like one of the faces, not only of the White Sox, but of Major League Baseball. And it's, it's really good to see. Yeah. You know, one of the things that's interesting too, and you touched on it there, is that TA is, is, seems like the kind of guy who almost thrives on the questions and the pressure like he wants to be that guy. That's a hard thing to find. Like we always hear about baseball players that have a ton of talent, but they have some sort of mental block. Like it's such a mental game and they can, they can overdo it. They can push when they shouldn't be pushing. They, they won't let the game come to them and that's what causes slumps. But he's the kind of guy he's like, yeah, bring it. That That's infectious. I would imagine, especially with a team where it, there's a lot of young players that still are not completely proven that we're going to be counting on in 2021. Yeah, you know, I think one of the examples that Tim sets is, is his fearlessness. Um, if you remember before game one of the playoffs this year or last year, 
against Oakland. You know, Oakland started a left-hander, and the, the White Sox just destroyed left-handed starters during the short season. And Tim comes on before game one and just says, you know, I guess Oakland didn't do their homework. So, I mean, that's just like kind of like, you know, poking the cage there. But it just shows that, you know, that's just, that's just his attitude that, you know, there is a lot of pressure in the game, but he, 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 he welcomes it and he thrives off it. For the White Sox, really, to get to where they want to go starting this season, I mean, they're going to have, you know, he, he sets a great tone. You know, hey, there's nothing to be afraid of. We're a really good team and uh, follow my lead. And he embraces that role. They are a really good team. One of the things we've been talking about, though, is that in terms of depth, they still haven't gotten to that point of where, let's say, the Dodgers are where a guy has to fight his way into the the starting lineup or into the five-man rotation. If they went out and got one more proven starter and found another bat, though, then you would have more competition. You wouldn't be sitting there saying, wow, I, why? I really hope Kopech is ready to go. You know, I really hope that Cease gets magically fixed by Ethan Katz. Like, it, do they still need that pitcher and that DH, and how likely do you think that they'll go out there and actually get it done before the season starts? Hey, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, if you kind of look around, especially the American League, I mean, there's been some movement, like a little bit with Toronto this week, Houston this week, but it's been, you know, and it's not surprising. I think everybody knew going into this offseason, still with the ramifications of COVID and everything, that it's, it was going to be a pretty slow market, you know, free agent-wise, trade-wise, and it really has been. So, I mean, you got to, on one hand, you give the, the White Sox credit, you know, they got Lance Lynn, which is a great pickup for that rotation. Like you just mentioned, they need, you know, they needed an, at least one there. They got Liam Hendricks, and then they got, you know, Adam Eaton back, obviously. But in talking to uh, Rick Hahn, you know, after the Liam Hendricks signing, he basically said, you know, our team's on the floor. He kind of quoted the, you know, uh, the Hoosiers movie. But, but he, you know, the door's still open, and I think they're looking around. You know, I was, I was actually hearing that, you know, maybe they bring back Jose Quintana, which didn't happen. You know, I, I was surprised, you know, Quintana got, got $8 million for one year from the Angels. But I, I still think they're they're looking at, you know, just because of the uncertainty with Kopech's been out for two years. Dylan C still can't throw strikes. So, you know, if a team with this kind of, you know, with, with their aspirations, you know, to really to win the World Series, you really, um, you can't rely, I, I think, on, on guys that, you know, you need more depth and you can't rely on guys that just you just don't know about. I, I look at this team and I, I have hopes for a lot of players, but one of the guys that we talked about over the last week or so, Luis Robert, we, were, we, we brought up the whole like Kyle Lewis versus Luis Robert thing. And our initial reaction on the show was, well, I mean, they're, pre they're pretty much like you, how can you like say that one's better than the other right now? But then you look at the stat line of Robert and you realize Although we saw these flashes of brilliance, he really needs to put it together and he needs to be like put it together for a whole season. I mean, that was only that was a very short season last year. What are your expectations being around the team or what are the team's expectations? Either one I'll take on what he's going to turn into in 2021. Yeah, you know, it's like when you watch Luis Robert last year, you kind of saw like what you saw with Eloy Jimenez's first year where. You know, Eloy was right out of the right out of the the gate. You know that for his first month, and there was an injury in there with him too. But boy, you know, like he just wasn't seeing any strikes because he was swinging at everything, and it just took him a while. Like most, you know, first year guys, no matter how how good they are, how good they're supposed to be, it's you know through all the years of covering baseball, I think Frank Thomas might be the only guy that never struggled, or seemingly never struggled. Um, so with with Luis Robert last year, I mean, his first season, it was a weird year, but it was a weird year for everybody. So, you know, he never made excuses. But that first month he had, I mean, he was like, everybody, forget like rookie of the year. Look at those his numbers he put up in the first month. And it, people were talking MVP with him, and that's how good he was. And his wall didn't, he didn't hit that wall until September where, you know, he was just a mess. Um so that you know, I think the White Sox were kind of expecting that, maybe not in the sequence it happened, um, but you know, they kind of, then he kind of figured it out in the playoffs. He hit that 500 foot home run uh, against Oakland, and, and he just felt like you could just tell at the end of the year. He just, I think that with Lee Robert, he, there was a little relief that okay, this season's over. I know what to expect now. Um, you know, and I'm going to be ready for this upcoming season. I think he's going to be really, really good. 
that, that that's not to say that he's not going to strike out. That he still has you know adjustments to make, but just if you just look at like just all the tools, you know, like so few guys have the tools that he does, and I think he'll get it figured out. Let's pivot back real quick, if you don't mind. I want to get just get back to TA because there was it kind of leads into this question here. Uh, last last episode we had Stephen Nelson from MLB Network on, and I I started the question talking about Tony Larusa. And uh, Stephen, in the middle of the answer, brought up something that really bothered him. And it was the that from his perspective, looking at things, that the moment LaRusso gets hired, everybody immediately went to, well, Tim Anderson's not going to get along with him. And he thought that was completely unfair. He's like, when did Tim Anderson ever ever show that he was unprofessional? And I I read things from him that says he's ready to go. He doesn't care. He like, yeah, let's go. Tony LaRusso, we're good. I'm ready to play. And he's saying all the right things. Have you gotten any overall feel as to what the players think about their new manager? Well, you know, Tim was the obvious one, and this he, he, like, he talked again yesterday, and Larusa came up again yesterday, and so that was the second, at least the second time, and I, I, there might have been another time when we had we talked to him after Larusa got hired. But, it, but basically, with, with Tim, with Tim, I mean, he's so honest. He's because you know he's like kind of the bat flipping, you know, new, you know like new era kind of player, and. LaRusso is the old school, you know, I'm not going to stand for that. And the you know, LaRusso's had some issues with bat flipping and stuff in the past. But, um, you know, with, with Tim, it's, he, he mentioned it again yesterday that, you know, anybody thinks I'm not going to like this guy. And he, he knows what LaRusso is. He knows he's a Hall of Fame manager. He knows he's won three World Series. And that intrigues him because Anderson's all about winning. And, you know, I, I I just think that once they talk, and Larus has talked about Anderson too, that he's not going to have any problem with him, and um, I think they'll get along fine. Uh, you, you know, the, the, as, as for the rest of the team, let's see, from Lucas Giolito, Lance Lynn played for Larusa when he was a rookie in uh, St. Louis. He loves him. Giolito. I mean, I think a lot of the the players that we that have been available through the off season here since Larusa were hired are surprised maybe that hey, here's a 76 year old manager that hasn't been in the dugout in you know decade basically and you know he's coming back now it's kind of an odd move but um they i think they all like have done their homework on la Russa and they they know he's all about winning and that's what this team's about so as long as they're winning i i think it'll be fine if they now if this team underachieves and i think that's where you're going to start seeing some cracks scott Krager from the uh, daily herald i appreciate you jumping on it was good to talk with you uh, if you want to follow Scott, well, pick up a Daily Herald or otherwise uh, follow him on Twitter. Uh, it's Scott with one T, Gregor with one G. Uh, well, uh, two of them, but only one in the middle. <laughs> Man, I'm terrible at giving out Twitter handles, but Scott, I appreciate you jumping on with me. Great. Hey, th- thanks for having me on, Chris. Great talking to you. Socks in the Basement listeners, do the hard work. And if you're a hardworking man or woman on the South Side, you need to be outfitted properly. And that's why you should visit Red Wing Shoes in Evergreen Park, New Lenox, and Geneva. A work boots specialty store that carries sizes from 6 to 16 and feet as wide as 4E. A 115-year-old company that came out of Red Wing, Minnesota. And one of its largest stores in the entire Midwest is in Evergreen Park, Illinois, ever since 1976. When you're on your feet, the footwear is everything. So why not get an expert fitting? They warranty, repair, and offer free conditioning with laces. And they also carry Carhartt work clothing as well. Located at 3347 West 95th Street in Evergreen Park, Illinois, at 208 East Maple Street on Route 30 in New Lenox, or at 1749 South Randall Road in Geneva. Visit them today. You work hard. You've earned it. Red Wing Shoes. Ed, there's so much to unpack from what we learned from Scott Greger. But the first thing that hit me was that within the last... 36 hours, I think. There's an article that went up in which, for some reason, somebody still wants to talk to Gordon Beckham. And the article's title, I just want to read this to you. Gordon Beckham, remember, he was a he was a big prospect when he came up for the White Sox. There were a lot of hopes for him, right? Ran through the, ran through the system quickly. Great hit tool. Yeah. The article title is Beckham Reflects on Hype and Pressure of Being Sox, quote unquote, Savior. Now, I never thought he was going to be a savior. I just thought, I think people were excited when he showed up because they were like, here's a prospect that the White Sox may have actually developed because that didn't happen very often, right? In fact, we're only really starting to see 
guys that the Sox draft and they, they come around and are actually good. This is not something that this team used to do on the regular. And here's another draft pick in Anderson who Gregor describes as, hey, he loves the pressure, bring it. Whereas I remember I was at the game, the debut of Gordon Beckham. People got up and applauded because their new guy was up and he had a bad game and he just seemed to never be able to adjust to the pressure. You need to find guys that are not only talented, but guys that can can handle the pressure. And I'm not trying to pick on Gordon Beckham here. The fan base, first of all, was never thinking you were going to be a savior. Not not for a second. Not, not, not for, for a second. second was I like, Gordon Beckham saving the White Sox. They had plenty of other things that they needed to have come true for that to work they out. They had just won the World Series a couple years prior yeah. to him coming up. He wasn't saving anything. He was going to be a continuation of that, hopefully. Yeah, the hope was we that this for. was going to be the kid that was going to come in and eventually was going to hit in the middle of your order. He wasn't saving any. That was That's absurd. But secondly, the rise of Tim Anderson is such a stark contrast to Gordon Beckham. Two guys, middle infield, have hit tools, have to develop a little bit more. And when they come up, they're part of another generation that's coming up. I mean, think about it. T.A. had to work through so many things in his first couple of years. I sat here on this show two years ago. You can go back and find it on demand. I've apologized for it about three, four times. I was like, I don't know if this guy's going to work out because it didn't work for him right away. But he well, and, and you weren't the only one thinking that. Yeah, he recovered and he learned his craft and he didn't back down. I mean, he's the kind of guy who probably looks in a mirror and goes, today's the day I turn this around, but actually goes and does it. He's got this extra little thing in him, which is the reason why he's really, I think he's the face of the organization. He's on the cover of a video game. The MVP was Jose Abreu, but TA's the guy that I see in all the, all the B-roll on MLB network. And then I see whenever they're talking about the White Sox, I see more Timmy Anderson than anything. He's the exciting guy who will sit down in front of the press and will answer any question that you ask him. Well, he's not just the face of the White Sox. He's one of the faces of Major League Baseball because he's an exciting player. He's an accessible player. He's a good quote machine. He's somebody that nationally you can get behind because he plays the game with that infectious joy. You know, that bat flip wasn't mean. That bat flip is Tim Anderson having fun. Oh, you know, Sal yeah. Perez was mean. Sal Perez took it the wrong way. Tim Anderson's just having himself a good time. And everybody kind of sees that. You know, is Tim Anderson the best shortstop in the majors? No. Is Tim Anderson the best leadoff hitter in the majors? No. Is Tim Anderson the best overall hitter in the majors? No. But he's up there. And he's turned himself into one of the, you know, one of the top average guys over the past couple of years because he changed his approach and he rose to the challenge and he figured out what he was going to be good at and what he was going to do. And he never let the game get him down. And so, yeah, the press can go to Tim Anderson. You know, he doesn't seem to shy away from talking about the game. He doesn't shy away from talking about social issues around the game, which is also an important thing these days. He does not shy away from being honest about himself or about the team. And you got to love that. So, yes, the fact that he's on a, a, you know, on a video game cover isn't, that's not by chance. That's not something that was you know, oh, well, let's let's throw the White Sox a bone. That is because Tim Anderson is a marketable player and one of the guys that the Major League system, the whole Major League Baseball, wants him to be out front. And that's pretty cool because we haven't really had that in this town. Even somebody like Frank Thomas, who had a very big national following, wasn't quite that guy, right? He wasn't the guy you marketed. He was just a superstar that had marketability. Uh, as we head for the door, first of all, I want to tell you a huge guest on the next show, and, and we're keeping it under our hat. Our socks in the basement trucker hat, by the yeah, way. Yeah, <laughs> which you can get online. Okay, but but not that all of our other guests haven't been huge, but I, I'm excited about this one. This one made my dad happy. Like, I called him up yeah. and told him who we bought. This one. And he was like, really? That's really cool. Like, he was, like, gushing. So, Dad can't wait for that episode to come out. Look forward to that on Wednesday. The other thing I want to point out, remember you we were talking about um, – uh, recently we were talking about uh, fantasy baseball rankings and we were talking about the Kyle Lewis, Lewis Robert thing. Yeah. And we were talking about how Lewis Robert isn't showing up high when they're trying to figure out like how many points he's going to score this year. A new article came out on that exact site. And now Lewis Robert is like, yeah, he might start off slow, but it's clear that if you had to pick between the two of them, because you wanted to have the better for the next five years on your fantasy baseball team, it was Luis Robert by a ton. 
Yeah, it's not even close. Exactly. So I wanted to kind of add that on, that little addendum. And I and Gregor kind of touches on it that he thinks that Robert figured some things out, even though he had that bad month, that you're going to get a much improved and you're going to continue to see his star rise, which is exciting for White Sox fans. But the, it, it's it's kind of funny when you look at when people are trying to evaluate it. It's like, yeah, they're pretty much the same. Lewis is better. He had a better year last year, and he's had a better career so far, and he's definitely the rookie of the year. But if I was building a team for the next five to ten years, Luis Robert all day. So I'm happy with that. That's got to make you happy. Oh, yeah. I, I'm, I, you know, I, I'm not worried. I'm not worried about the shredder not recognizing the fact that Luis Robert had a bad stat line last year because – I know he's going to be really, really good. And really good. Really, really fun to watch. Really good. And imagine if, imagine, imagine if the Tim Anderson moxie continues to influence that kid. Man, we might have a whole team of guys that are just swagger, swagger and hits, baby. Hey, you know what swagger and hits get you? What does swagger and hits get you? World Series rings. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always on socksinthebasement.com.